Theory as History by Jiris Banaji. Uh, chapter 1 Introduction Themes in Historical Materialism. By modes of production, Marx meant forms of domination and control of labor bound up with a wider set of class relations, expressi expressive of them and of the social functions implied in them. He saw these general forms and the class divisions grounded in them as historically created, that is, specific to the period they belong to, yet capable of subsuming often much earlier forms as an intrinsic part of their own form of development. As, for example, in the connection between Roman civil law and modern production, Marx also believed that these general configurations, totalities of production relations, were defined by an inherent dynamic that worked itself out in the eventual dissolution of existing relations. How this happened or could happen was of course best described in his description of capitalism and its general laws of motion. The essays published in this collection span a period of just over 30 years from debates in the late 1970s down to 2009, and set out first to map a general conception of modes of production as historical characterizations of whole epochs. In other words, to restore a sense of historical complexity to them, and then to illustrate, explore some of that complexity in detailed studies based as far as possible on primary source material. Marx himself was opposed to supra-historical approach that simply reduced historical characterizations to formulae. It was obvious to him that historical materialists would have to study the different forms of evolution and compare them before a workable characterization was available for any period. He said as much in his reply to Mikhail Mik Mikhailovsky's to Mikhailovsky. By contrast, most Marx's historiography of the pre-capitalist period tends to assume we already know the different modes of production from the labels attached to them and lacks any sustained attempt to grasp, explore, construct their complexity. Kula's study of feudal economy had a considerable impact precisely because he broke with this method of formal abstraction. The challenge is formidable. We shall almost certainly never be able to replicate the rigor that Marx could demonstrate in his analysis of capitalism for any comparable epoch before it. But historical materialism establishes an element of continuity between that analysis and attempts to understand earlier periods. That Marx conceived the complexity of historical modes of production in law-like terms is clear from the famous citation in the Nechtreg to the second edition of Capital, where the Russian reviewer's description of his method claimed, method claimed to Marx's approval that what chiefly interested him were the special laws that regulate the origin, existence, development, and death of a given social organism and its replacement by another higher one. That social organism was Kaufman's peculiarly biological way of referring to the general form of society characteristic of the main historical periods in Europe's development is clear from his statement elsewhere that for Marx, every historical period possesses its own laws. After this introductory essay, chapter two develops this theme of the complexity and law-like nature of modes of production as Marx understood these against the background of literature and debates that were current in the 1970s. That its central arguments are still relevant today is shown by the present state of discussion of these issues. One of the key distinctions suggested there was between relations of production and forms of exploitation. Yet the conflation of these categories is still endemic to a whole form of Marxism and runs through even some of the best historical work, such as Chris Wickham's recent book, where Marxist feudalism where Marxist feudalism is seen simply as coercive rent-taking and lacks any historical depth beyond that. Wickham's conception of what constitutes a feudal mode of production is so general that even the Roman Empire finally contains at least two versions of it. 
Again, Pierre Bonassi's contention that a slave economy persisted down to the aristocratic upsurge or feudal revolution of the 11th century is a classic instance of the same confusion. The widespread use of slaves in the early Middle Ages certainly implies a continuance of slavery as a form of exploitation, but surely not the survival or persistence of a slave mode of production, however that is construed. Another example, and one of the few recent attempts to return to these issues in a more theoretical way, John Haldon ends up recommending a conception of modes of production that denies that we can sensibly speak of them containing tendencies, much less laws of any sort. The essays collected in this book range widely across historical periods. They strike a balance between theory and history, suggesting that historians cannot construct viable models of the periods they deal with without a grasp of theory and without attempts to use it creatively. They discuss themes that are basic to Marxism, but do so in ways subversive of existing orthodoxies. To take just one example of this, at least three of the papers address the issue of historical capitalism in one way or another. In the Grand Reis, Marx implied an interesting distinction between forms such as capital, which belong to a specific epoch of history, and categories which belong more or less to all epochs, such as, e.g., money. Since capital presupposes money and emerges out of, out of its circulation, the emergence of capitalism, conceived historically, presumes a necessary connection between these two sorts of forms. In other words, the contrast between them cannot be a historical gap separating one from the other. Marx was clearly aware of this because, unlike the widespread dogma that locates capitalist origins in a largely English and agrarian context, the famous chapter on primitive accumulation ends with a note that tells us that Italy was where capitalist production developed the earliest. Mediterranean location for early capitalism shows how flexible Marx himself was in the understanding of capitalism's history and the great possibilities that can be opened up for scientific research programs based on a flexible and rather more, and rather more sophisticated grasp of historical materialism. 1.1 Questions of Theory To take modes of production first, these, for Marx, comprise the relations of production in their totality, as he says in Wage, Labor, and Capital, a nuance completely missed by Marxists who simply reduce them to historically dominant forms of exploitation or forms of labor, for example, positing a slave mode of production wherever slave labor is used, or ruling out capitalism if free labor is absent. The underlying assumption here is that Marx means by relations of production the relations of the immediate process of production, or what in a perfectly nebulous expression some Marxists call the method of surplus appropriation. But the immediate process of production can be structured in all sorts of ways, even under capitalism. This was a point that was probably better understood in the 1980s than it is today. For example, when Lewis Taylor described early 20th century changes on the hacendas of Cajamarca in Peru, he stated quite rightly that, according to Lenin, a Marxist analysis of rural society cannot mechanically identify forms of exploitation and relations of production. The distinction drawn there between capitalist relations of production and pre-capitalist forms of exploitation permeated much of the historical work on South African agriculture, such as when Helen Bradford in a general review of this literature noted that quasi-feudal relations of exploitation and racist relations of oppression were created in the very course of capitalist penetration in South Africa's countryside. The general distinction here is one between relations of production and forms of exploitation, and Marxist theory would advance considerably if more Marxists took this on board. The point here is not just that relations of production include vastly more than the labor process and the forms in which it is organized and controlled, the immediate process of production, as Marx called it, such as when Marx calls money a relation of production in the Grand Reis, or suggests in the poverty of philosophy, 
that a relation of production is any economic relation, but that labor itself, the exploitation of labor, breaks down into comparable dimensions of complexity. This is best illustrated by contrasting the general forms of domination of the peasantry with the concrete or specific ways in which landowners dominate, control, and deploy peasant labor. When Carlo Pony described the struggle of the Bologna landowners to impose new methods of plowing on their misery and the different ways in which the peasants thwarted or circumvented those methods because they involved considerably more effort, this was not a statement about the mode of production that prevailed in northern Italy in the 17th century. Sharecropping or labor tenancy or even the forms of labor service described by Lenin in the development of capitalism in Russia lie at a very different level of abstraction from serfdom, peonage, etc., conceived as historical categories. Yet all these categories at both levels are about ways of controlling and exploiting living labor. The historical forms of exploitation of labor, slavery, serfdom, wage labor, is the usual trinity in most discussions, Marx tended to add Asiatic production, cannot be assimilated to the actual deployment of labor, as if these were interchangeable levels of theory. Since the latter is defined by immensely greater complexity, a conflation of these levels would mean endless confusion in terms of a strictly Marxist characterization, the kind of confusion attacked by Taylor and by Bradford. The conclusion here can be stated quite simply by saying that the deployment of labor is correlated with modes of production in complex ways. Not only are modes of production not reducible to forms of exploitation, but the historical forms of exploitation of labor, relations of production in the conventional sense, lie at a completely different level of abstraction from the numerous and specific ways in which labor is or can be deployed. Chapter 3 lays out a general argument suggesting that in agriculture, especially, a much wider range of relationships of exploitation on the land is revealed than is suggested by some Marxists. Indeed, the logic that regulates the combination and use of different categories and forms of labor in the agrarian sector is one that cuts across historical periods, so that similar forms of labor use can be found in very different modes of production. In short, given the argument above, modes of production have to be constructed as objects of much greater complexity and a different sort of complexity. The theory has to be stripped of its evolutionism and refurbished to allow for more complex trajectories. For example, transitions to capitalism do not simply replicate some universal mo uh, model or fixed sequence such as the one implied in the canonical genealogy of European culture slavery, feudalism, capitalism. There were whole parts of the world where forms of capitalism evolved without the canonical antecedents of slavery and feudalism, the most obvious being the Islamic world. Um, see chapter 9 um, for more information about that. As Marxist reviewers said, every historical period possesses its own laws. But certainly by the 16th century, those endogenous developments were soon bound up with the dynamics of an expanding international capitalism, several European capitalisms, each with its zone and its circuits, so that their least of all could on, could fuck, so that their least of all could one study the indigenous expansion of capital in its pure state unaffected by disturbing influences. That sentence should have been edited. Again, the transition from slavery to feudalism was scarcely driven by some spurious logic that led ineluctably from one to the other. Serfdom was not caused by the decline of slavery. Indeed, Mark Bloch himself pointed to the renewed vigor of slavery between the late empire and the ninth century and the subjection of the peasantry through most of the Middle Ages, but especially after the year 1000, needs other explanations. At another less obvious level, perhaps, the theory also needs depth. For example, 
How do we integrate the expansion of monetary economy into a theory of modes of production? The idea that pre-capitalist economies were based universally on natural uh, economy is no longer tenable. Marx himself knew enough Roman history to know that the, study, that the steady decline of the peasantry in the last two centuries of the Republic was bound up with the enrichment of the nobility and the formation of huge slave-run estates. The same movement which divorced them, the free peasants, from their means of production and subsistence involved the formation not only of big landed property, but also of big money capital. Indeed, by the last decades of the Republic, the Roman monetary system had evolved sufficiently for one scholar to refer recently to the complexity and sophistication of late Republican and high imperial finance. Credit was pervasive and institutionalized and added enormously to the money supply. Roman money was, in other words, more than coinage, and there were financiers who held their entire capital in outstanding loans. Nomina. Again, in the Grand Reis, Marx writes, It is clear that the changes in the value of the material in which money represents itself, directly as in the value of the material in which, oh, sorry, directly as in gold, silver, or indirectly as claims in notes on specific quantity of gold, silver, etc., must bring about great revolutions between the different classes of a state. If so, where, where in the theoretical space that surrounds our notions of a mode of production do these great revolutions come? How do we account for them in terms of the theory itself? Unless relations of production are constructed and defined to have the sort of reach and conceptual power that can integrate all the fundamental phenomena or movements that social and economic historians deal with as their staple, conquests, demography, monetary expansion, historical ruptures like the great transition from Tang to Sung, crises within regimes such as the state of Russia at the death of Ivan the Terrible, in 1585, major ecological changes, etc. Marxist historians who work on anything other than capitalism will, will simply continue to pay lip service to historical materialism, as, an, as Anderson does in passages from antiquity to feudalism in some striking demonstrations of bad theory. By bad theory, I mean the substitution of purely theoretical explanations for historical research and or recourse to a theory that is itself simply a string of abstractions. If the breathtaking formalism of pre-capitalist modes of production drove Heinness and Hearst into a wholesale repudiation of the theory of modes of production within two years of its publication, Anderson at least pulled off a major tour de force, certainly with the longer of his two volumes. Lineages of the Absolutist State was a striking piece of comparative history, and it is hard to see how anyone could have covered so much ground, especially in the two essays taken together, without relying largely or entirely on the work of other historians, and no special grasp of any of their sources. The issue here, however, is Anderson's use of Marxist categories, ostensibly as the scaffolding of the whole panoramic edifice. If bad theory in pre-capitalist modes of production was an extreme, but ultimately positivistic formalism that destroyed itself in its rapid auto-critique, in passages from antiquity to feudalism, it surfaced sporadically as a metaphysical mode of reasoning that is best exemplified perhaps in the following excerpts. In the first, Anderson writes, The fall of the Roman Empire in the West was fundamentally determined by the dynamic of the slave mode of production and its contradictions. Once imperial expansion was halted, it was always in the Western provinces that the remorseless logic of the slave mode of production achieved its fullest and most fatal expression. The second passage tells us, the Byzantine Empire, in effect, up or unloaded enough of the burden of antiquity to survive into a new epoch, but not enough to develop dynamically across it. It remained transfixed between slave and feudal modes of production, unable either to return to the one or advance to the other in a social deadlock that could only eventually lead to its extinction.
but no historians of late antiquity have ever invoked slavery as the fundamental reason for the fall of the Western Empire, at least not since Anderson published Passages. Indeed, slavery remained widespread in the late empire and has little to do with the crisis of the 5th century. And the second passage presents us with the image of a society transfixed between modes of production for centuries together for some 900 years, which must leave any reader wondering what Marx himself would have made of the historically interminable or interminable deadlock of rural modes of production. In both cases, Anderson as well as Hindus and Hearst, it is the lack of complexity that undermines a credible use of categories which are, potentially, the bedrock of any materialist conception of history. What sort of complexity, then? One form of this has been outlined briefly in the distinction I drew earlier between relations of production and forms of exploitation, as well as the different levels at which we have to construe or grasp exploitation itself. These distinctions generate another, a second level of complexity, because if, say, the accumulation of capital, that is, capitalist relations of production, can be based on forms of exploitation that are typically pre-capitalist, then clearly there is not one ostensibly unique configuration of capital, but a series of distinct configurations, forms of the accumulation process, implying other combinations. Chapter 9 to 10 are about configurations of this sort, dealing with commercial and money lending capitalism respectively. Configurations of capital which, like commercial capitalism in particular, comprised a rich variety of forms, from the peculiar domination of small producers by merchants discussed by Marx in the Grand Reis, widespread not just in the European Middle Ages, but throughout the Muslim world, to the large-scale Havana merchant houses, who controlled the smaller Cuban planters through refaction, refaction? Uh, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, contracts, and were themselves intimately linked with U.S. merchant houses and British banking institutions, or the London financiers, West India merchants like the Lascelles, who underwrote the expansion of sugar and slavery in the English-speaking West Indies, and eventually took over the management of plantations formerly under the control of their business associates, becoming large-scale planters by the 1780s. The paper reprinted here as Chapter 2 argued years ago that Marxists had no good grounds for resisting the idea of a slave-holding capitalism of the kind that dominated the economies of the American South and the Caribbean more generally. In a brilliant paper published in New Left Review at the end of the 1970s, Orlando Patterson had already noted in passing that, for all its eloquence, Genovese's pre-capitalist conception of the Old South is no longer tenable. He referred to the essentially capitalistic nature of modern slave formations, such as those of the British and French Caribbean, and contrived the more general expression, American slave capitalisms, arguing that, in the context of modern capitalism, Slavery was simply a variant of the capitalist system. It is these ideas and premises that have gained much wider support among historians of the Old South today than the traditional dogma that slavery could not possibly form a configuration of capital, a form of capitalism, because it was the most extreme antithesis of free labor. Historians have happily broken out of this tautology. Patterson's assessment of the mood among historians of the Old South was remarkably accurate. In the introduction to the ruling race, James Oakes declared, I agree with those historians who stress the capitalist nature of the slave system in the Old South, and went on to explain. Implicitly equating capitalism with free labor, Genovese argues that slavery was a pre-capitalist form of social organization whose logical outcome was a paternalistic worldview, and it was the slaveholder's paternalism, as he sees it, that created a constant tension between the slaveholders and the capitalist world marked in which they conducted their business, market in which they conducted their business. But Genovese does not explore the nature of this tension, nor does he examine in any, det 
any detail its manifestations within the Old South. A 1988 paper by Ransom and Such began with the vigorous assertion, Karl Marx recognized the capitalist nature of American slavery long before American historians. They went on to state the discovery or rediscovery of the capitalist nature of slavery has proven to be a significant development. This breakthrough not only has prompted a complete and far-ranging re-examination of racial slavery in the Americas, it has also stimulated a renaissance in the field of American economic history more generally. And by the mid-90s, the historiography of the South threw up its first revisionist microhistory. William Dusenbears, now classic first volume on the massive rice plantations of South Carolina and Georgia, with the bulk of their capital invested in slaves, and enormous irrigation schemes in pounding and threshing mills, and with marked economies of scale and remorseless control of workers stripped of any paternalism. Dusen Bear's description of low country slavery is the best critique to date of Genovese's paternalism, or pre-capitalist, thesis, and demonstrates how little of that there was in the vigorous agricultural capitalism that dominated the rice swamps. The idea that the history of capitalism comprises a series of, con of configurations of capital helps to resolve the dilemmas and paradoxes behind much of this debate, and others like it, since historians like Dusenbeer insist that they are describing a variant of capitalism, not some featureless abstract model, and that a slave-based capitalism was bound to display features specific to this variant, planter capitalism. Now, what this variant does demonstrate is that free labor, so-called, cannot be an essential moment of capital, not if the self-expansion of value is intrinsically indifferent to the forms in which it dominates labor, as Marxists such as Rosa Luxemburg and Henrik Grossman surely understood. Luxemburg herself referred to capitalist accumulation with forms of slavery and serfdom, with meaning based on, and Grossman suggested that the whole character of the Spanish and Portuguese colonization was capitalist from its inception, even if the plantations were based on slave labor, accepting Sombart's description of the plantations as the, as the first truly large-scale capitalist organizations in history. The argument developed so far has at least two major implications for theory. In the first place, it frees up conceptual space for rethinking the history of capitalism as a much richer and more complex set of trajectories than the conventional stereotype of capitalist history as a history of the first capitalist nation. A small part of this richness and complexity is indicated in chapter 9 by showing how one of the key institutions in the emergence of capitalism, the form of the partnership, may well have been the Muslim world's major contribution to the business culture of the Mediterranean in the, central middle, in the central Middle Ages. Marx tended to periodize capitalism into manufacture and large-scale industry, ignoring merchant capital as in an as in antediluvian form. But it was through the rapidly expanding commercial world of the Middle Ages that capitalism emerged in a more systematic guise. Marx had a sense of this because in volume one, he admits, we come across the first sporadic traces of capitalist production as early as the 14th or 15th centuries in certain towns of the Mediterranean. And in volume three, he allows for the direct domination of production by commercial capital, setting the colonial trades. The claim that Holland was the model capitalist nation of the 17th century was not a claim about internal transformations in the Dutch economy in the early modern period, so much as a statement about the Dutch colonial empire and the forms in which the VOC secured that country's commercial supremacy. In the essay that concludes this collection, chapter 12, I have suggested tentatively that we might mark the historical distinction between these early forms of capitalism, dominated by merchants and, and bankers, and the international syndicates they formed, and the developed form of capitalism analyzed by Marx and Capital, by describing the former quite simply as capitalism or historical capitalism, and reserving the term capitalist mode of production for the latter.
but this is largely a matter of terminology. The more substantial point is to retain some sense of the richness of the history of capitalism. The second implication relates to, to the issue of labor. If free labor is not a precondition for the accumulation of capital, or even for whole forms of capitalist economy, but the contingent outcome of struggles to shape the law and the social relations behind it, no more is the absence of coercion a precondition for the deployment of free labor itself. It is crucial to think all this through dialectically, because capitalist relations of exploitation are being construed increasingly by a seductive dichotomy between free and unfree labor, as if these categories were actually opposites. That was certainly not how Marx understood free labor. When he wrote, a presupposition of wage labor and one of the historic preconditions for capital is free labor and the exchange of this free labor for money, or that with free labor, wage labor is not yet completely posited, since wages might still be regulated by statute. Free simply meant dispossessed, divorced from the means of production. Indeed, this was generally true of the way free labor was understood in the 19th century. As Hay and Craven state, free labor emphatically was not understood to be labor free of penal coercion in the colonies, as it was not in England itself. Blackstone's Commentaries, the dominant textbook, textbook of English law between 1770 and 1850, still embodied a feudal model of wage labor, where the master-servant relation was based on status and not on contract. In other words, discussed under the law of persons. It is a supreme paradox that the first country of industrial capitalism was also the one most sharply characterized by what Can Freund called an atrophy of the contract of employment for most of the 19th century. It was the lingering strength of the feudal mode or the feudal model of wage labor in England that explains the anomalous structuring of the English labor market discussed by Steinfeld. That as the market for labor expanded, criminal sanctions for contract breaches proliferated. Breaches proliferated. Penal sanctions for contract breach were only abolished in 1875. In other words, when Marx was writing Capital, English workers were still not formally free. They labored in the shadow of a legal regime that could compel the performance of contracts by the threat of criminal sanctions. It was not the repeal of the law of apprenticeship that formed the true watershed, as Marx himself seemed to think but the abolition of penal sanctions for breach of contract in 1875. The further consequences of all this are, first, that the formal freedom of wage labor, this essential formality, as Marx calls it in the famous Appendix to Capital, Volume 1, is not, in Marx's view, its essential characteristic, but merely the deceptive appearance that mediates its essential nature as a form of subjugation by capital. The voluntarist model of wage labor that was constructed in the 19th century under the will theory of contracts was not one that Marx himself accepted, at least not as an essential determination of capital, although it still remains the most widespread delusion people have about modern capitalist economy. The urgent, er, sorry, the argument is propounded in chapter five below and has received a thunderous response from Tom Brass who continues to believe that the dichotomy between free and unfree labor is a meaningful one. Whereas to my mind, this contrast taken literally only makes sense as a reference to the legal and social status of workers who are as individuals free, enslaved, or held in some form of legal bondage. Under capitalism, all workers are subject to some form and degree of domination and it is profoundly misleading to forge categories like unfree labor in some diffuse sense that implies the construction of free labor as its alleged opposite, thus undermining the basis of Marx's critique of wage labor and its legal mystification. In the second place, the forcible creation and regulation of labor markets are an intrinsic feature of capitalism and Marxists need to abandon the naive view that law somehow stands outside this process and is not intrinsic to it. 
Duncan Kennedy and his colleagues in critical legal studies demonstrated as much in the 1980s, and Thompson had to remind Althusser that he, as a historian, found that law did not keep politely to a level, but was at every bloody level. It was imbric imbricated within the mode of production and productive relations themselves, as property rights definitions of agrarian practice, and it was simultaneously present in the philosophy of Locke, etc. The labor market has never been a purely economic phenomenon, and the relative freedom of workers, the fact that some are freer than others, is entirely a matter of struggle and of the plasticity of legal reasoning. A final issue, what about the Asiatic mode of production? How do we deal with that today? Since none of the essays in this collection address the issue in any way, the section that follows is an attempt to map out possible ways of both discarding Marx's formulation and retaining the essential elements within it. Well, um, 1.2 A Marxist Characterization of Asiatic Regimes it goes without saying that Asiatic is a misleading description on several counts, not least for its Orientalist baggage. It is retained here to project continuity with Marx's discussion of the Asiatic mode and, it, and to expand on a central theme in Oriental despotism, namely the peculiar absence of a ruling class that emerges organically from the depths of society and achieves sufficient stature to control and dominate the state. The tradition that influenced Marx in the 1850s, long before he read Kovalevsky, maintained that Asiatic despotism lacked intermediate and independent classes between the sovereign and the mass of the subject population, or more realistically, that the aristocracy such as it was, was a creature of the sovereign and completely unlike any equivalent group in Europe. What the unbroken despotism of the Eastern world had lost respect for was, of course, the right of property, which is the basis of all that is good and useful in the world, as Bernier exclaimed in a hugely influential description of Aragen or Aurangzeb's empire. Bernier correctly discovers the basic form of all phenomena in the East. He refers to Turkey, Persia, Hindustan, to be the absence of private property in land. This is the real key even to the Oriental heaven, Marx famously told Engels in a letter dated June 1853. Bernier was, of course, aware of the existence of a nobility in the Mughal state. It should be borne in mind that the great Mughal co constitutes himself heir of all the, hom all the Omras, or lords, and likewise of the mans or Mansibdars, or inferior lords, who are in his pay, he wrote, adding, and what is of the utmost importance that he is proprietor of every acre of land in the kingdom, excepting perhaps some houses and gardens which he sometimes permits his subjects to buy, sell, and otherwise dispose of among themselves. The king being proprietor of all the lands in the empire, there can exist neither dukedoms nor mar marquisates, m marquisates, nor can any family be found possessed of wealth arising from a domain and living upon its own patrimony. No family can long maintain its distinction, but after the Amra's death is soon, ex is soon extinguished. In other words, the Amirs, or Amras, as he called them, lacked any significance, because unlike the nobility in France, they lacked the stability of a hereditary class, yet Bernier was willing to acknowledge that the Jagardars enjoyed an authority almost absolute over the peasantry, a nuance Marx ignored in reducing Asiatic regimes to the bipolar simplicity of a mass of village communities on one side and an all-powerful sovereign on the other. 1.2.1. From the Asiatic to the tributary mode, Marx, Halden, and beyond. 
This bipolar model of isolated village communities in an all-powerful state fails as a description of Asiatic regimes for at least three substantial reasons. To take the least interesting of these first, Marx's characterization of isolated and self-sufficient village communities was drawn from English accounts of the early 19th century that were both embroiled in actual controversies regarding the best kind of revenue system to introduce in various parts of India and far removed from the, from the reality of most Indian villages, which were scarcely the little republics Sir Charles Metcalfe imagined them to be. Certainly the self-sufficiency of the Indian village was a myth. There was nothing more remarkably autarkic about the Indian by comparison with the European village. Indeed, the scale, range, and penetration of exchange relations in urban and rural Mughal India were so extensive that they are simply incompatible with Marx's description of the Asiatic mode of production. And Athar Ali makes the point that Marx's village community model could hardly apply to the Ottoman Empire, and Iran, which has no caste system to supply her a hereditary fixed division of labor. A second more substantial reason for rejecting the way Marx construes the Asiatic mode is that it is simply not true, as Richard Jones claimed, and Marx himself implied that the Asiatic sovereign had nobody of powerful, no body of powerful privileged landed proprietors to contend with and that the regimes of Asiatic despotism lacked any significant types of class formation. In fact, it should be possible to argue that a comparative political economy of Asiatic regimes or of the tributary mode of production on which they were founded is best constructed along the kinds of ruling class kinds of, that the sovereign had to contend with and the historically distinct ways in which the relationship between ruler and ruling class was configured. This is something I shall attempt briefly below. Third and finally, Marx's handling of the claim that, in Jones's words, throughout Asia, the sovereigns have, have ever been in the possession of an exclusive title to the soil of their dominions, or as he himself put it, the claim about the absence of private property in land, a notion which made its way into the draft pages of Capital, Volume 3, was thoroughly uncharacteristic for the uncritical way in which he simply repeated the core doctrine of the Orientalist tradition with no further penetration of the issue. The point here is not that Asiatic regimes, Muscovy included, were not typically defined by their own doctrines to the effect that the entire territory of a sovereign was in some sense his or her property, but that this claim took very different forms in different regimes was asserted to unequal degrees and, most crucially, from a Marxist perspective, was largely a legal or political fiction, or at least is best construed as such. Thus, in China, Twitchett states that traditionally all the lands of the empire were considered theoretically as belonging to the emperor, but by the beginning of the Tang dynasty there was a strong and ever-increasing movement towards the recognition of the right of private of private possession of landed property. The Tang seems simply to have accepted the growth of such great holdings and recognized the principle of private ownership of land. But in law, the rules of the Chun Tian land allotment system remained in force and the doctrine of the emperor's ownership of all land remained unquestioned. There could scarcely be a better expression of the largely doctrinal nature of the ruler's claims. Roughly analogous to this was the position under the Safavids when, as Lambden argued, the theory of the ruler as the sole landowner did not receive in practice complete and unqualified acceptance. In practice, private persons enjoyed full rights of ownership over land. Again, in the Mughal case, Athar Ali suggests that the doctrine of state property could seldom be distinctly enunciated in view of the lack of its reconcilability with Islamic law. In Byzantium, as Oikonomides points out, the state was the largest landowner of all, 
to it belonged all the land that was not owned by private individuals or institutions. Thus, here the principle existed in a much less absolute form, and Alexander Kazdan was always in a minority among Byzant Byzantinists in his view that ownership of all land vested in the emperor. The one Asiatic regime where the doctrine was asserted in its purity was the Ottoman Empire, the primordial instance of Oriental despotism and the closest Eastern parallel to, to the autocracy of the Muscovite state. Needless to say, the actual arrangements under which land was held were more complex and subject to variation, and what really impressed travelers to the East, both in Turkey and in Russia, was the peculiar servility of the ruling class, a theme I shall come to in a moment. Yet even these broadly comparable autocracies reflected so-called state property in radically different ways. As Richard Pipes says, the great princes of Vladimir regarded their realm as their vocina, that is, outright property. Muscovy was the purest example, historically, of a patrimonial regime, one in which there was no notion of a public order distinct from the rights and claims of the sovereign, so that the kingdom was literally the personal patrimony of the prince. The Islamic model was a very different one, by contrast. Conquered territories were retained in the public ownership of the Muslim community, and the underlying principle was that public revenues should be, sent, should be spent in the interests of all Muslims, not of rulers of privileged groups. This was a legal fiction, of course, and one that allowed for developed notions of private property and land. Having said this, there is in Marx's fascination with the absence of private property and land an important clue to a different mode of production, from that which came to define a small, if dynamic, sector of Europe in the Middle Ages. Marx himself was clearly reluctant to accept feudalism as a sensible or historically accurate characterization of large parts of the world, where class relations and production were structured so differently. It was the peculiar dominance of the state that set these regimes apart from Western Europe. And of course, Marx expressed his aversion to the idea of an all-encompassing all feudalism in the excerpts from Kovalevsky's book, which he made in 1879. There is no dearth of reference to these famous passages. It is clear that by the 1870s, when he read Kovalevsky, he had abandoned his earlier view about the government as the original owner of all the land, denouncing its doctrinal character and the role it played in legitimating the dispossession of indigenous communities by the French in Algeria and the British in northern India. The lousy Orientalists, etc., have recourse in vain to the passages in the Quran where it is said of the earth that it belongs to the property of God. He comments acer acerbically after noting, there is no trace of conversion of the entire conquered land into do a dominial property. In the Multiqua ul Uber of Ibrahim Alebi, who died in for, uh, 1549, the massive legal compilation that formed the basis of Ottoman law. This was a major shift of perspective, but one which Marx never theorized in the sense that he seems never to have returned to the Asiatic mode of production and may just have quietly buried it. The crucial difference between the abstraction of an oriental despotism founded on the possession by the sovereign of an exclusive title to the soil, Marx's Asiatic mode of production, and the more densely textured and complex picture that emerges in the notes from Kovaleski is the completely fictitious idea in the Orientalist model that Asiatic despotism was marked by an absence of classes between the sovereign and the mass of village communities. In reading Kovaleski, but also some of the sources he used, Marx would have realized how distant his formulation of the Asiatic mode was from the actual history of countries such as India, where in Kovaleski's description, much of the conflict centered on the aspirations of the Muktas, Kovaleski's Iktidars, to make their assignments of revenue or Iktas hereditary and independent of the Sultan.
The reference here is to the 13th century Delhi Sultanate. And here's a quote from that large quote. The Iktidari military aristocracy sought to make their prerogatives hereditary and independent of the Sultan as the beneficiary in Western Europe or beneficiary in Western Europe. The Persian Barani, according to Kovaleski, said that Giasad Din Balbim, Bal, Balbim, Balbin had found the monarchy shattered to the ground because of the ictadors of his father, the father of the slave Giyas ad Din Balbin, later vizier of the Sultan Nasir ud Din Muhammad, who appropriated the title of Khan, strove for independence and divided among themselves the wealth of the state treasury. Instead of appearing at military reviews, they excused themselves for not appearing and secured their usurpation each time by bribing officials. The majority of the Iktidars directly renounced the military service on the grounds that the Ikta had been given them not as conditioned, but as unconditioned property, so-called in M. Thus, already in the 13th century, the Iktidars drove towards mulk or milk, complete property, which the Sultan could only give and gave only in reality from the dominial estates and the wasteland that was reckoned there too, usually to worthy officials and courtiers. These remarkable pages on the Delhi Sultanate could well have formed the basis for a more complex and sophisticated description of Asiatic regimes had Marx had the inclination. Kovaleski described a form of class struggle that pitted ruler against ruling class, and in his pages on the Mughals, the gradual consolidation of a subversive rural aristocracy, the Zamindars, whose relation to the state had always been fraught with tension. This, for Marx, was not feudalism of any variety, but nor could it have seemed even remotely comparable to the way he and Engels had construed the Asiatic mode of production in the 1850s. Lenin's characterization of Russia as an, as an Asiatic state and Trotsky's repeated insistence on the peculiarities of Russia's historical development are, I suggest, best understood in materialist terms. As the expression of a historical dynamic and of class relations founded on a mode of production that was neither some exotic variant of feudalism nor certainly an inert rep replica of the Asi Asiatic mode. But if not feudalism or the Asiatic, Asiatic mode, then what? As Terry Byers asked, with evident bafflement, when summarizing a collection of papers on the theme in 1985. The tributary mode of production now looks to me like the best contender for a Marxist characterization of Asiatic regimes and has both attracted support from leading currents in the Spanish historiography of Al Andalus and been discussed at length by John Heldon. The strength of Heldon's analysis is the focus on imperial states, late Rome and Byzantium included. These, strangely, were never discussed by Marx, who showed little interest in late antiquity. And the perception that tributary is a much better characterization of these states in their economic regimes than the description of them as feudal. But Haldon jeopardizes this insight by suggesting that the distinction between tax and rent is purely formal, since they are both, char since they are both charges on peasant labor, or modes of surplus appropriation as he calls them, so that feudal and tributary economic regimes are ultimately simply variants of a common and indeed universal pre-capitalist mode of production. This makes little sense to me historically, as to Marx as well, and differentiates Haldon's understanding of the tributary mode sharply from that of his Spanish colleagues, for whom the whole point of a different, uh, of a different characterization is to retain the historical peculiarities of, in their case, Islamic economic regimes, the economic regimes bound up with the military expansion of Islam, in contrast to developments in most of Western Europe. Unlike Haldin and with Pierre Gouchard and Manuel Essien, 
I believe it is crucial not to minimize the historical difference between European feudalism and Asiatic-style economic regimes. This vindicates Marx. But unlike Essien and his use of the expression Islamic social formation, the historical complexity of the tributary mode is, I feel, best restored to it by abandoning the positivist distinction between modes of production and social formations. In fact, in Asien, the distinction is residual since he speaks of social formations tout court and speaking instead of the possible ways in which a mode of production can be, can be configured historically. Capitalism is a good example of this sort of historical complexity, as I suggested earlier, but so in fact is the tributary mode, as I shall now try and show. 1.2.2 Ruler and Ruling Class Configurations of the Tributary Mode The tributary mode of production may be defined as a model of production where the state controls both the means of production and the ruling class, and has unlimited disposal over the total surplus labor of the population. This is bound to strike many Marxists as an anomalous formulation, but that is because the theoretical issue here is one that has hardly ever been discussed in historical materialism, chiefly because Marxist debates on the nature of the state have focused very largely on the capitalist state, framing the issue in terms of the state's autonomy, and thus starting from the presupposition that state power and class interests are analytically distinct. But formulations like Milibin's partnership of state and capital will simply not work for tributary regimes, where, as Trotsky understood in his brilliant pages on the peculiarities of Russia's historical development, the Muscovite state shaped the evolution of the possessing classes in a fundamental way, and quite unlike anything seen in the West. Trotsky himself preferred to speak of the incompleteness of Russian feudalism, its formlessness, this, like the recurrent image of Russia standing between Europe and Asia, left the issue of theory open. The profound differences between the whole of Russia's development and that of other European countries was a challenge for historical materialism that might well have been met, had the circumstances of the revolutionary movement been less fraught with tragedy. But to round off the point I want to make here, even Theta Skokpo, when dealing with imperial states such as Russia and China, automatically assumes that we can sensibly posit a dominant class that is distinct from the state. To describe the Russian nobility as politically dependent vis-a-vis -vis the imperial authorities is a bizarre understatement for anyone with a sense of the history of the Muscovite absolutism. In the Grand Reis, Marx treats oriental despotism as a form of communal property whose real foundation is the inert m multiplicity of stable agrarian communities that vegetate independently alongside one another. This communal mediation of production of the community as a presupposition of labor undermines the separability of the economic from other levels of social reality and in any characterization of pre-capitalist modes of production and certainly of the Asiatic mode. Paul Froelich's image of a ruling bu bureaucratic caste superimposed on a peasant economic base, this about China, is not a sufficiently integrated image of the relations of production of the tributary mode, which involved both the control of peasant labor by the state, the state apparatus as the chief instrument of exploitation, and the drive to forge a unified imperial service based on the subordination of the ruling class to the will of the ruler. The late motif of much of the historical writing on tributary regimes is the paramount importance for the ruler of a disciplined ruling class. The bond between the ruler and the ruling elite within the wider circles of the ruling class was the basis on which new states were constructed, and the state itself bureaucratized to create an efficient tool of administration. The autocratic centralism of the tributary mode and its backbone in the recruitment of a pliant nobility were not just political superstructures to some self-contained economic base. They were essential moments of the structuring and organization of the economy, of the relations of production. Moreover, tributary economies had considerably more vitality than Marx ever attributed to the Asiatic mode. Late Rome in the 4th century, the Eastern Empire under 
Justinian. China in the expanse, expansive phase of the southern Sung and Mughal India in the 17th century were, were prosperous, powerful states with a vast financial capacity. They were scarcely exemplars of a stagnant Asiatic despotism. On the contrary, the financial drive was always paramount. The entire government apparatus was built and constantly rebuilt in the interests of the treasury. As Trotsky said about Russia's state economy, the late Sasanian, late Roman and Mughal states had staggering levels of monetary circulation, which were bound up with the assessment and collection of the land tax in cash. In some ways, that was even more true of the Umayyads and Abbasids. As for China, the achievements of late 16th and early 17th century England were in many respects even exceeded by the impressive expansion of mining and manufacturing in 11th century China. Max Weber's discussion of patrimonial domination in economy and society is a useful starting point because it works, at least implicitly, in terms of the distinction between landed nobility and patrimonial officialdom, or landowner and bureaucrat, land and office, as radically different types and sources of power. It is the variant combination of these elements, as I shall call them, that structures his description of the leading patrimonial states, and even if some of those descriptions are simply wrong or inaccurate, the following discussion of the crucially different ways in which the tributary mode was historically configured retains the distinction and varying articulations of his elements. To start with one of Weber's more schematic and certainly less accurate descriptions, the late Roman Empire is characterized in the striking image of a disconnected ju juxtaposition of landed nobility and patrimonial officialdom. In the late Roman Empire, the increasingly important land-owning class of the possessors confronted, confronted a socially quite distinct stratum of, of officials, he writes. But the hallmark of the late empire was precisely Constantine's creation of what Santo Mazzarino called a unitary bureaucratic organism based on a fusion between senators and bureaucrats. Constantine restructured the aristocracy to produce a tighter integration of the senatorial clans with a new imperial administration and expand the governing class as a whole by the induction of new elements. And if Weber's disconnected juxtaposition remained only partially true of the Western provinces, where the senatorial clans had a greater freedom of action and would eventually undermine the survival of the imperial state, it was the opposite of the truth in the East, where, on the contrary, it was the bureaucracy that threw up a powerful new class of landowners in the main part of the 5th century. The renewed growth of a Byzantine aristocracy from the 8th century following the imperial crisis of the 7th, did not fundamentally modify its 6th sixth, sixth century character as a class that dominated the key offices of state as a bureaucratic elite with substantial land holdings in the provinces. The key difference was that now the more purely bureaucratic element, the civilian aristocracy of Constantinople, remained sharply distinct from the military aristocracy of powerful aristocratic clans based in the provinces. The continuity of these great clans, the Fossades, Melanoi, Scleroi, etc., sets them apart from Bernier's stereo stereotype of the ephemeral ruling class of Asiatic despotism. But though Ostrogorsky saw them essentially as feudal magnates out to destroy the central power, the theory of a Byzantine feudalism, it is crucial to see that this now overnightly or over mighty landed aristocracy remained part of the Byzantine bureaucratic hierarchy in Ostrogorsky's own expression, and that even for the families most solidly established in the provinces, the emperor's service was the main means of acquiring wealth. The conflict between ruler and individual factions of the mainly military aristocracy, especially in the 10th century, was one that typified all Asiatic regimes and was a struggle not primarily for control of the peasantry, but for power, 
reached not by a monolithic and unified class of, ar of aristocrats on one side against absolutism on the other, but by factions or alliances among magnate families who were themselves divided and where individual rulers could always count on the support of leading aristocrats. As Chinet remarks, this aristocracy, which becomes stronger during the following centuries, that is, after the 8th century, has nothing feudal about it since until the 11th century. The imperial authorities always controlled it, forbidding its members any real autonomy in the provinces where they resided. Born out of service to the sovereign, it never ceased to be linked to him, even during the period of the Komenoi, or Komenoi. If this essentially integrated model of a bureaucratic elite extending its sway over land holding without ever establishing the kind of autonomy that might have affected its emancipation from the clutches of autocracy is one quintessentially elite antique configuration of the tributary mode, China represents another more purely bureaucratic version. Weber suggested that here in China, the patrimonial bureaucracy benefited from the even more complete absence of a landed nobility than was the case in Ptolemaic Egypt. But this is simply not true. As Nito Tarajiro Tur Tur argued in a series of brilliant pieces contemporary with Weber, the evolution of a modern style autocracy in China followed a long period, many centuries, of aristocratic dominance. During those centuries, though China was, nor was formally ruled by a monarchy, the monarch was simply the common property of their <coughs> the aristocratic class, merely a representative of the aristocracy, which dominated the leading organs of the state down to later Tang. Aristocratic government reached its zenith between the six dynasties and the mid Tang, declining in the transitional era from the late Tang to the Five Dynasties, till its final and rapid dissolution in the turmoil and civil wars between 880 and 960, from the Sung Dynasty on. The period Nato identified as the start of the modern era in China's history. The power of the sovereign developed within, without limitation, based on a new class of professional bureaucrats drawn from a much wider social base, who now became the agents of the ruling dynasty. As Twitchett says, NATO's theory was stated in very general terms, but the general outline which NATO perceived, largely by intuitive understanding, has stood up remarkably well to the progress of modern research. Implicit in the outline is a sequential mo model where, unlike Byzantium, the Tang Sung transition that straddles the same centuries sees a radical restructuring of the ruling class as a small group of extremely powerful lineages who had completely dominated the political scene and monopolized highest offices of state through their rights to hereditary employment are displaced by a new class of professional bureaucrats. Completely different in character for, from the Quan Chung arist aristocracy and other great regional groups and the enduring base of the autocratic regimes that would henceforth rule China into the modern world. It was the great historian Chen Yin Ko who analyzed the class dynamics of this transition in detail, showing how during the Tang, the ruling house itself, a member of the close-knit Northwestern aristocracy, presided over a court divided by a constant tension between the old aristocracy and a new class of professional bureaucrats recruited through the examination system. The examination system was in his view, a means of providing the dynasty with a bureaucratic elite dependent upon the dynasty for its position and authority, rather than upon lineage and heredity, hereditary privilege. When the Tang fell, not a single one of the regimes of the, of the succeeding five dynasties period was ruled by one of the great clans of the early Tang national aristocracy. Thus here, the bureaucratic elite was precisely not the aristocracy, but its historical successor the instrument of a new autocracy dominated under Tang by a permanent conflict of these very social forces that was resolved increasingly in favor of the officials who had come up through the examination system.
The late Tang was the beginning of a major transformation of the economy, which continued until the Mongol invasion. The economic expansion of the late Tang, Five Dynasties, and early Sung period involved such dramatic economic and social changes, and the Chinese economy began to grow at such a rate that some historians have seriously suggested that by late Sung times, the conditions were ripe for the emergence of a modern capitalist society. The vast reaches south of the Yangtze River, with their massive infusion of newcomers from the north, the renewed expansion of large estates now linked to a new, more rapacious class of officials, the scholar gentry, the substantial pool of dispossessed labor driven from the land by political turmoil and land grabbing, with up to 70% of registered households dependent on landlords for their survival, and the role played by the large landed interests in the reclamation of farmlands from river bottoms, lake beds, swamps, sandbanks, and coastal flats, with rapid improvements in agricultural techniques and the invention of new implements were part of the major transformations that lie at the back of the surge of commercial capitalism that swept through China in the Sung period. Cities such as Hangzhou and Keifang were the most populous the world would see for centuries, the former concentrating a population of well over a million in an, era, in an area of some eight square miles. By the mid-10th century in 955, the bells and statues from thousands of Buddhist monasteries had to be melted down and cast into coins to feed the rapidly expanding money economy. And by the mid-11th, money taxes amounted to over 50% of fiscal income, the bulk of this from the state monopolies on salt, tea, and alcohol, and from the taxation of trade. Huge sums of money were in circulation, available for investment in commerce and industry. For example, the colossal flow of Chinese ceramics to the West is, is a good example of a purely capitalist industry with factories located close to the major ports, often sprawling over entire valleys and controlled, no doubt, by the business magnates of the southeastern coastal cities. Quanzhou was the base of a regulated private capitalism geared to international markets, and further north, the iron and steel industry of northern Kangsu was also privately owned and operated, with some 36 complex and costly mining and metallurgical establishments of Li Kuo Chen, employing over 3,600 full-time wage laborers. According to a memorial presented by Su Tung Po in the 1070s, each of the 36 great houses, Ta Chia, possessed tens of thousands of strings of cash and liquid capital in addition to their investments in mines, land, plant, and equipment. The fatality of the tributary mode could scarcely be more strikingly demonstrated than by the example of China. The state both encouraged and regulated foreign trade, it opened harbors and dredged canals, built breakwaters and warehouses, and encouraged merchant involvement in the management of state enterprises. It was also state demand for iron, for armaments, coinage, agricultural tools, etc., that fueled the expansion of the metal industry, and on a more general level, in terms of the dynamic at work. The location of the central government in an area almost always generated a period of, of intra-regional intra development and its removal, an era of systemic decline. The southern sun capital Hangzhou helped stimulate a period of rapid growth in the lower Yangtze during the 12th and 13th centuries. Development was the result of inter-regional integration brought about by a fiscal system which artificially reduced freight costs by subsidizing the transport of tax revenues and state purchases. To finish with China, the powerful landed interests behind the creation of the so-called Wayland, this is the reclamation of lake bottoms and riverbeds that became widespread in the 12th century, were actually the most powerful personage personages in the government. This was true not only of the local government, but also true with regard to the central government. The Sung scholar Matuan Lin indignantly refers to the fact that east of the Yangtze, Tsai Ching and Qin Kui, notorious leading ministers of the Sung court, successively owned the Waylands. The lands of today are mostly the lakes of yesterday. Those who are responsible for the Wayland seem only uh, 
to know that the lakes can be drained and reclaimed for cultivation, but do not seem to realize that land outside the lake will thus be flooded. This is because the responsible parties are court favorites and powerful officials. Hence, they can, without fearing any interference, condemn the neighboring land to the fate of a watershed and thus benefit themselves by hurting the people. In other words, the rapacious landed interests of these expansive centuries were an inextricable part of the Sung bureaucracy and a pattern peculiar to China's configuration of the tributary mode. This can be described either as collusion between the bureaucracy and the landed elite, powerful families whose words and influence could dominate the government, as an official of the Southern Sung put it, or as court favorites and powerful officials, grabbing land on a model of a state building especially characteristic of the official class. In short, China represented a fusion of landed and bureaucratic interests where no aristocracy in any conventional sense was involved, at least not by this stage, and the autocracy was rarely, was rarely strong enough to defend the financial interests of the government by opposing its own officials. Russian absolutism from the period of Muscovite consolidation in the late 14th century on was almost the opposite of this. And here, Weber's intuition is more accurate than Anderson's. Anderson reads Russian absolutism on a European model, assimilating the boyars to the feudal aristocracies of Western Europe and describing the Russian autocracy itself as an absolutist state of a type which was common to most European countries in the same epoch. This essentially feudal reading of Tsarism contrasts sharply with Trotsky's repeated emphasis on the historical peculiarities of Russia's development or fails to explain why Trotsky himself characterized the Russian state as a bureaucratic autocracy or bureaucratic absolutism, an intermediate form between European absolutism and Asian despotism, and one that was possibly closer to the latter of these two. The Russian nobility was, as Weber described it, entirely powerless in relation to the ruler. The crown could indeed risk a behavior toward the nobility, even toward the bearers of the most famous names and owners of the largest properties, which no Occidental ruler, no matter how great a potentate, could have permitted himself toward the lowliest of his legally unfree ministeriales. The conducting, the conducting wire that runs through the early history of the Muscovite state is the subordination of the aristocracy, the boyars and the Moscow nobility, and their integration into a class of servitors, who, as Andrei Pavlov notes, lacked not only political freedom, but even the last vestiges of economic in independence in relation to the ruler. During the 15th and 16th centuries, the Moscow monarchy succeeded in eliminating allodial holdings and making secular land tenure a form of possession conditional on state service. The principle of compulsory service, namely that all land must serve, formally introduced in 1556, would effectively mean that private property of the means of production became virtually extinct. The, op the oprichnina uprooted boyars holding large Vachina estates in the central regions of Muscovy and led in the end to a profound transformation of the aristocracy that rendered it entirely dependent on the monarchy. The future belonged not to the boyars, but to the Dvorian. During the three centuries separating the reign of Ivan III from that of Catherine II, the Russian equivalent of the nobility held its land on royal sufferance. This was the feature of Russian despotism that struck every observer from the West and, of course, the Russian intelligentsia itself of the 19th century, when Trotsky wrote of the Russian state and its possessing classes that it forced, regimented, it forced and regimented their growth and compared Tsarism to an Asiatic despotism, he drew on a long tradition within the intelligentsia. Romanovich Slavid Slavatinsky had argued in 1870 that the Russian nobility was fundamentally a creation of the state. This is the fundamental difference which separates our service nobility from the feudal landowning aristocracy of Western Europe. And Milyakov, who saw the Pomesti system as a Muscovite borrowing from the Oriental states.
explained how the final forming of the landed aristocracy took place in Russia, as in Turkey, on the foundation of autocratic power, that is, when the national state was already founded. A random hiccup. In all these cases, the appropriation of state lands by private owners did not lead to the feudal organization of society, because the central power was already too strong to be dispossessed of its superior rights in the land. Thus the conflict peculiar to China between a hereditary aristocracy, the great aristocratic clans that disintegrated in the late 9th and early 10th centuries, and the new class of professional bureaucrats that formed the backbone of the autocracy, has no Russian counterpart, both because the aristocracy inherited from the appendage period survived but was ruthlessly subordinated, certainly by the 16th century, and because the Russian monarchy never allowed its service class to sink roots in the countryside. Both aristocrats and the mass of Dvorian were simply elements of a unified service class, and here it would be more true to speak of the bureaucratization of the nobility, certainly by the 18th century when Peter the Great set out to modernize this class. The noble bureaucrats of Peter's reign were state servitors first and landowners second, reflecting the deep-rooted traditions of the pre-imperial Muscovite state, which, Web which Weber correctly characterized as patrimonial. Although Russia was the only tributary, non-feudal regime that saw the widespread emergence of serfdom, the, pe the peculiarity of Russian serfdom was that the peasants fixed to the land did not belong to their landlords. The model is a late Roman one, where the tying of the peasantry to the land reflects a more widespread bondage driven by the needs of the treasury, and so it was in Russia. But perhaps the best analogy for Russian serfdom comes from the Romanian principalities, where the ensurfment of the peasantry was fiscally driven, this at the very end of the 16th century, and the similarity with Russia argued, persuasively in decades ago, by Br Bratianu. The ferocious domination that held the Russian upper classes in the vice of Tsarism meant both a pliant aristocracy and one that was committed to a strong monarchy, and the absence in Tsarist and Imperial Russia of any effective regional loci of power, able to stand up to central authority. Mughal India differed profoundly in both respects, and of the four configurations described here, was the tributary mode with the least integration between its elements. The provincial magnates of Byzantium were part of the bureaucratic hierarchy, an administrative elite subservient to the emperor despite the, dissen the dissensions Basil II complained about and the aristocracy's potential for subversion. There was no distinction here between a service nobility and a rural aristocracy. China, too, lacked any disconnected juxtaposition of elements. Once the Chinese state was rid of the powerful arist aristocratic clans that had dominated the administration during Tang and all previous regimes. The dominance of a sophisticated literate bureaucracy was the hallmark of China's moder modernity, and conflicts within the state were largely conflicts within that class and its rival factions. And in Russia, Again, aristocratic subservience to the crown would only weaken significantly in the last decades of the 18th century. Yet, even then, the Russian nobility was never a threat to the state. Thus, India under the Mughals was totally exceptional in evolving a model that juxtaposed a service elite with powerful regional aristocracies. The disconnected juxtaposition of a subservient subversive rural aristocracy with a tightly disciplined class of administrators, the manseb mansebders, who formed the service nobility and the backbone of the state. If the late 15th century Ottoman expansion had successfully integrated members of the Byzantine and Balkan nobility into the highest reaches of the Ottoman administration, neither the Sultanate nor even Akbar would, e would ever succeed in achieving anything remotely comparable. The Gurd conquests had established a basis for Muslim rule in the North Gangetic Plain, while leaving certain Hindu rulers on their thrones in return for the payment of tribute. A century later, under Allah al Din, in return for the repayment of, in return for the payment of tribute. No, that's wrong. 
A century later, under Allah al-Din Khalji and his imposition of Karaj over a considerable part of northern India, the subjection of this rural aristocracy, more advanced now, meant the transfer of a significantly larger share of the agricultural surplus from the countryside to the towns and from the Hindu chiefs to the Muslim governing class. But, of course, the Hindu chiefs, powerful, independent, and autonomous chieftains, as Nurul Hassan described them, were never completely subordinated, much less exterminated, and every succeeding dynasty and regime had to contend with them. Akbar is justly praised for recruiting the Rajput chiefs into the Mughal ruling hierarchy and for giving a radical turn to the relationship between the center and the landed magnates. Yet even after the huge expansion of the Mughal governing class between the 40th year of Akbar and the early part of Aurangzeb's reign, these powerful Hindu chieftains remained barely 15% of the official ruling elite. The fact is that disarming and subduing regional aristocracies or converting them into officials was a formidable task that was rarely accomplished by early modern states. The Zamindars, as the Mughals now came to call these local rajas and regional aristocracies, were bastions of endemic rural resistance. It was precisely from the Zamindars that they, the Jagardars, met with the greatest opposition and hostility. There was always, as Manichi said, some rebellion of the Rajas and Zamindars going on in the Mughal kingdom. The widespread agrar agrarian uprisings of the 18th century, led by the Zamindars, were the key symptom that the Mughal effort at internal consolidation of power had simply failed. The drastic loosening of the imperial structure that came by the 18th century was driven as much by these political factors. The way its tributary mode was configured in class terms, as by the enormous economic expansion that reconfigured the relationship between the center and the regions throughout India. The expansion was, to a great degree, a legacy of the Mughal state itself and of the peculiar dynamism of the tributary mode in stimulating monetary growth. By the 1580s, the Mughal regulation revenue system funneled huge sums in copper coin and silver rupee into the hierarchy of imperial treasuries. Food grains and other crops sold for cash in a network of rural and urban markets moved from the countryside to the cities in an annual rhythm in response to this state demand for, repay for payment of its tax levies in cash. Akbar's empire maintained large and growing reserves of both gold and silver, showing that the Mughal fiscal dynamic was inextricably bound up with the world economy and India's ability to attract substantial flows of bullion and foreign specie through species through an expanding international trade that was vital to the fortunes of European commercial, commercial capitalism in the 17th century. As John Richards argued, the vast currency of the empire depended on rising European silver and gold imports. The deluge of new world silver carried to India was of direct benefit to Akbar's construction of the empire in the latter half of the 16th century. To sum up, tributary modes of production were class regimes characterized in their developed forms by a powerful monetary economy and considerable economic dynamism. They were world-scale economies constructed on imperial foundations, that is, installed through conquest and expansion, and built on centralizing administrations capable of steady expansion as new provinces were added to the empire. Moscow's expansion in the late 15th and 16th centuries was gigantic, and yet the greatest conquests were still to come. By the middle of the 17th century, the Tsars of Russia ruled over the largest state in the world. Byzantium, too, was the legacy of an empire that had expanded over centuries, then contracted sharply in the 5th to 7th centuries to reconstruct itself later. That reconstruction involved renewed expansion. The Muslim states in India expanded over centuries, from the Gurid conquests at the end of the 12th century to Aurangzeb's campaigns in the Deccan at the end of the 17th. If the 18th century saw the final dissolution of central power behind the facade of autocracy, this was due not to stagnation, but to the forces of economic expansion unleashed by the tributary regimes themselves, from the longer cycles of demographic and commercial, demographic and commercial growth 
to the evolution of indigenous networks of commercial capitalism dominated by commercial classes at every level, starting with the great banking houses. The fiscal expansion of the Mughal regime between Akbar and Aurangzeb was a formidable achievement, and as Richards notes, peace, order, and new market opportunities, as well as state encourage encouragement, increased the surplus to be shared between producer, middlemen, traders, brokers, moneylenders, zamindars, and the state. Indian peasants in the 17th century grew a large number of food and industrial crops efficiently and well, and by the 1680s, hundreds of prosperous market towns had proliferated in northern India. The import of large quantities of precious metals by the companies contributed to the expansion of the Mughal regime, with Bengal offering the most dramatic example of export-stimulated economic growth. In short, the secular trend for Mughal India was that of economic growth and vitality, but with the counter-finality characteristic of the dissolution of all modes of production, it was precisely the wealthy and more prosperous parts of all the great empires, which in various ways and at various rates seceded from, ignored or revolted against the fragile imperial, he imperial hegemonies. As Bailey says, the decline of the great empires now appears more like a consequence of their very success, the price of their earlier rabid expansion, which is a way of saying that the trajectories of the tributary regimes were driven by an internal logic, or what Marx called a law of motion. Finally, what about relations of production in the narrower sense? Marx argued that in tributary modes of production, in contrast to feudalism and its tradition of bondage, the relationship of dependence does not need to possess any stronger form, either politically or economically, than that which is common to all subjection to the state. In other words, the general form of exploitation was simply one that subjected the peasantry to taxation by the state. To this, we can now add that this general form of domination of the peasantry, the same general economic basis, could display endless variations and gradations in its appearance, not so much, as Marx himself seemed to think, as the result of innumerable different empirical circumstances, natural conditions, and so on, i.e. not just for purely contingent reasons, but because of the way tributary modes were configured in class terms. In the model of the tributary mode described by Guchard for Valencia, a relatively weak state apparatus, and the ruling aristocracy, linked to it confronted strong rural communities. Ironically, this is the configuration closest to Marx's own conception of the, of the Asiatic state. In contrast, in the Byzantine model, rulers would periodically have to defend a more vulnerable peasantry against the depredations of the powerful. And here, paroikwe were widespread on private estates. In an even more extreme and probably exaggerated contrast, Bernier emphasized the oppression of the Mughal peasantry, blaming the Jagirdars for a hurried rapacity and constructing a whole explanation of the rapid decline of the Asiatic states on, th on this basis. But here, even more than in Byzantium, rulers showed a manifest interest in curbing the oppression of the peasantry, and it was almost certainly the eventual dissolution of central power and of the imperial authority that went with it that left the villages to the mercy of zamindars and capitalists, transforming the riot into a field laborer, living from hand to mouth. By the 1880s, Marx was fully aware of the complexity of landed interests in regions such as Bengal, an evolution that had come about long before the English, and one that, for him at least, had nothing to do with feudalism. This ass, this ass fear calls the constitution of the village feudal. I feel like, I don't know. The endless British confusion about whether the Zamindars were revenue collectors or landlords reflected the agrarian conditions of a disintegrating tributary mode of production, where the early 18th century drive to expand revenue in distant provinces, such as Bengal, had led to a massive concentration of Zamindari rights and the Zamindars were beginning to look more like landlords than revenue collectors.
but they were essentially fiscal intermediaries, and as John Shore alone among British officials pointed out, a property in the soil must not be understood to convey the same rights as India or in India as in England. When the British made the Zamindars into proper landowners, transforming their tributary, tributary jurisdictions into estates, they simply ignored the reality of the Bengal village where respectable agricultural castes, the backbone of the Jodhadar tenantry, with holdings that could run up to 6,000 acres, exploited a largely untouchable mass of sharecroppers, tenants at will, and hired laborers. The distinction implied here is easier to track from the last decades of the 18th century, and certainly in the 19th, when emerging capitalist relations of production, tributary, and colonial in form were mediated through an endlessly complex range of relationships of exploitation on the land in the United Provinces the reclassification of whole masses of the population as tenants, and the domination of most cultivators by a controlling minority of traders and zamindars. In Bengal, the emergence of a substantial peasantry and its control of the rural credit market, and so on. And finally, of course, Russia was the one tributary regime where Asiatic despotism would eventually subject its peasantry to forms of exploitation, typical of the feudal mode of production. A widespread Marxist view that lacks any sophistication works back from the form of exploitation to the mode of production and concludes that therefore Russia under Tsarism was a feudal society with typically feudal relations of production. One hopes that this introductory essay and the chapters that follow will show why we need to abandon this way of thinking and restore a sense of complexity to the theory of historical materialism. 1.3. Some general conclusions. When Marx, wrote that, when Marx wrote that with the expansion of a world market dominated by the capitalist mode of production, the civilized horrors of overwork are grafted onto the barbaric horrors of slavery, serfdom, etc. He was half suggesting that forms of exploitation that were typically pre-capitalist could be integrated into capitalism, the production and accumulation of surplus value. Rosa Luxemburg referred to the po to the most peculiar combinations between the modern wage system and primitive authority in the colonial countries and used the example of the closed compounding of workers in the De Beers diamond mines at Kimberley to, il to illustrate this. But the forced recruitment of wage labor in the colonies or the outright use of forced labor in German mining, construction, and metals under fascism are but one sort of indication of the complex ways in which capitalist relations of production, the accumulation and competition of capitals, can be structured in terms of the actual exploitation of labor. Relations of production are simply not reducible to forms of exploitation, both because modes of production embrace a wider range of relationships than those in their immediate process of production, and because the deployment of labor, the organization and control of the labor process, correlates with historical relations of production in complex ways. Lenin's pages on the labor service system in Russia, with their fine distinctions between bonded hire and purely capitalist wage labor, and between the leasing of land and the allotment of land to workers as a method of providing the estate with manpower, are a model of how Marxists can restore a sense of complexity to their analysis of exploitation. The deployment of labor. The capitalist system of providing the estate with agricultural workers by allotting patches of land to them was widespread in Latin America and parts of Europe, the Middle East, India, South Africa, and so on, but of course just as systematically misconstrued as the residues of feudal or semi-feudal modes of production, uh, of production to justify political interventions that stopped short of confronting capitalism. Marx himself was certainly aware of the complexities peculiar to this level of, of abstraction. Engels tells us that in, in the 1870s, Marx began to study sources in Russian by way of work towards a final draft of his section on ground rent. Given the manifold diversity of forms of landed property and exploitation of the agricultural producers in Russia, this country was to play the same role in the part on ground rent as England had done for industrial wage labor in volume one. Unfortunately, Marx was never able to carry out this plan. 
Had Marx lived to complete the new version of this section, we would no doubt have had an even more powerful demonstration of what it meant to study the more concrete forms, the manifold diversity of forms of exploitation, in this instance of the peasantry in Russia. Again, when Marx writes that the legal forms in which these economic transactions appear as voluntary actions of the participants as the expressions of their common will, and as contracts that can be enforced on the parties concerned by the power of the state are mere forms that cannot themselves determine this content. The argument is not that law is irrelevant to production or an excrescence on the economy. On the contrary, Marx's whole definition of commodity production presupposes the legal concepts of private property and contract. As Duncan Kennedy argued in the 1980s, the legal categories are built into the definition of the mode of production. Legal concepts are built into the base itself, or in a later formulation, legal rules define the base. In Kelman's words, the determining structural base includes vital legal elements. For example, a competitive market, free labor. However, this conception of the interpenetration of law and society undermines the base superstructure distinction at least in the conventional form in which it has been upheld in some versions of Marxism. There are no pre-legal relations of production, just as there are many different regimes of specific legal sub-rules that are consistent with the indeterminate general notions of property and free contract. The more general point here is that markets are always constituted by the law that enforces the bargains made in them. Master and servant regimes constructed the labor markets of the 19th century as much as they regulated the relations between wage labor and capital. These are insights of critical legal theory that can surely only strengthen the perspectives of historical materialism. Finally, primitive accumulation is no longer the best way to frame the early history of capitalism, and this not because the epoch of commercial capitalism did not contribute decisively to the rise of modern production. It obviously did but because that remains a purely teleological perspective and one that diverts attention from the real lacuna in materialist historiography, which is the study and, one hopes, ultimately a synthesis of the emergence of capitalism, which in the sporadic form that Marx described it as having was certainly in place by the 13th century. If the obscure early centuries of capitalism were defined by the sporadic existence of capitalist production, this was much less true of the 15th century, when a sort of merchant-controlled industrial capitalism was widespread in centers such as Genoa and led the way into the great watershed of the 16th century. The section on primitive accumulation sums up much of the history it deals with as the period of manufacture, but manufacture, as Marx knew, was a legacy of commercial capitalism, of the fusion of commercial capital with production, as indeed were the slave plantations. The forms thrown up by the early capitalism of the Mediterranean were essentially those that continue to drive global history, down to the expansion of large-scale industry and its revolutionary mode of production in the 19th century, so that the history of commercial capitalism is no longer simply a prelude to industrial capital, but more like an act to retain the operatic metaphor, something that is best seen as a totality, a narrative that its own coherence forms internal periodization and conceptions of empire. Marx was right. The different moments of primitive accumulation can be assigned in particular to Spain, Portugal, Holland, France, and England in more or less chronological order. Only today, with so much more histori historiography before us, there's no compelling reason why this whole swath of history should remain the compressed, if brilliant, histoire raison raisonnée Marx inserted into volume one and not acquire the expansion of content it deserves.